Hey guys, it's Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this time of online learning and growing together. I am humbled and honored that you are allowing me to be a part of your spiritual development, and I'm grateful that you're a part of mine as well. Tonight, we're going to be looking at 2 Kings, the second chapter, the first 14 verses. And we're going to be talking about Elijah's departure. Now, it's often said that there are only two things that you can count on, and that is death and taxes. But in Elijah's case, he only had to deal with the taxes. According to the scripture, Elijah is one of two people who never tasted death. They just, God just took them. Uh, the other person listed in scripture is this guy named Enoch. In Genesis, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 24, we read these words. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God just took him. Uh, that is an amazing account. And uh, tonight, as we talk about Elijah's departure, I know it's not a, a pleasant topic, but the reality of it is all of us are going to leave this world one way or another. And uh, we do want to be prepared for that time. And while Elijah and Enoch are two people listed in Scripture who... Uh, didn't have to die in order to go on to be to their eternal reward there the bible does tell us that there will be others who will bypass death when jesus returns first thessalonians the fourth chapter verses 13 through 18 says this i do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope for if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so god will bring with him those who sleep in jesus for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Paul, in writing to the Thessalonican church, uh, had to clarify for them that uh, they, they were concerned about those who had already died in the Lord and would they partake of that resurrection. And, and Paul just makes it very plain here that when the Lord returns, those who happen to be living at Christ's return, those believers, won't have to worry about tasting death. They'll just be taken up. Well, Paul also had to deal with this with the Corinthian believers. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 51, we read these words. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible, this corruptible, rather, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So again, at the Lord's return, those who are alive, the believers who are living when Jesus returns, they won't be tasting death either. But for everybody else who, before Christ's return, there's a high likelihood that we are going to step into eternity. And we, in order to do so, we're going to have to go through some death experience, some departure of that sense. Now, Elijah's, uh, the account of Elijah's departure is found in 2 Kings chapter 2, the first 14 verses. I want to read that for us tonight and see what we can glean from this particular experience. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. 
So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you, from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. And then Elijah said to him, Elisha, you stay here, please, for the Lord has called me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So, and so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you, before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit come upon me. So he said, You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle that Elijah had fallen the mantle of Elijah that had fallen for him and struck the water and said, "Where is the Lord God of Elijah?" And when he also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Our friends, that is quite uh, uh, an account of someone's leaving this world and going on to glory. Uh, it didn't happen that way for anybody before then, and it hasn't happened that way for anybody since. But Elijah was no ordinary man. Uh, well, he was an ordinary man, I guess in that sense, but uh, he also put faith in an extraordinary God, and God did amazing things through him. So as we consider Elijah's departure, there are some things that are of significance that I want us to glean. Um, one, on Elijah's last day in this world, he spent time in four distinct places. He was in Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and the Jordan River. Now, historians note that the three cities he visited were where the schools of the prophets were located. It's very likely that Elijah wanted to spend some time encouraging those that he had helped to mentor. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. When you kind of realize that your time in this world is coming to a close, there are some significant people that you might want to get with. And by the way, since we don't know when our time in this world may come to an end, um, it is good and right for us to make the most of whatever time we have with those significant people. All right? Chuck Swindoll notes that these four places each represent a significant point of reflection for Elijah and for us. So uh, these points that I'm about to make uh, are, have been given to me by Chuck Swindoll through reading his book. So please take note of this. The first place that Elijah mentions in this portion of scripture, where they are to begin with, is at Gilgal. And that is a place of beginnings. It is here that God's people first camped when they entered the promised land under Joshua's leadership. And perhaps Elijah reflected here on the day that he first sensed God's call on his life. There are places in our lives that are significant for our beginnings. Maybe you can go back to the very hospital that you were born in, at. Um, I can't do that any, anymore. I was born at Grace Memorial Hospital down in Welch. That hospital has long since been torn down, okay? But there still may be some places where you can go that are of significance for a beginning with you. 
Maybe uh, for you and your spouse, it is where you went on your first date. That might be a good place to go on your anniversary, okay? Um, maybe it is the, where you got married. Um, maybe it could be a place where uh, you had your kids or significant moments with your kids. Maybe it's of a spiritual nature. Uh, there was a time when I could go back to a town not far from where I'm at right now, a little town called Welch, about an hour from Princeton, and I could go into the church that I was raised in, and I could point you to the place that I knelt and accepted Christ as my Savior. I could point you to uh, a, a place where uh, this, this place of beginning, my journey with Christ, took place. I could take you to the pulpit where I preached my first sermon. I could take you, I could still take you to some locations where as a new Christian trying to follow the Lord and try to, to learn how to live for Him, I would go and I would begin to sense God's call. Uh, for many, uh, on many occasions, I would be running out over the bypass that's over Welch. And while I was running, I could imagine myself preaching the gospel. I was sensing God's call then. In those places, sometimes it's good to go to those actual loca locations and you can sense those places of beginnings and, and the time where God put, first put his call on your life. I know that's been helpful for me and I don't know where those places are for you, but I hope you find them. And I hope from time to time you go and do some reflecting there. Now, you don't have to camp there. You have to spend all your time there. But sometimes it's good to go and revisit those just to reaffirm some things. It's very likely that Elijah was doing that when he went to Gilgal. Another place that he went was Bethel, and that would be a place of prayer. The word itself means the house of God. It's a place where Abraham built an altar and spent much time calling on the Lord. Maybe, just maybe, Elijah was remembering here those times of prayer that he had at the brook Cherith where the ravens brought his food. And maybe he also reflected on the times in Zarephath where he trusted God day in and day out to provide the oil and the flour for them to survive another day. Or maybe he reflected on the time of prayer that he had where he raised the widow's son and uh, from, from death back to life. Whatever was going on in Elijah's mind, we know that he went to Bethel and that it was a place of prayer. Are there some significant places of prayer for you? I know there are for me. Uh, every church that I've been a part of, including this one, had altars somewhere where you could go and pray. And behind me, you can see altars in somewhat of a U shape here. And uh, from time to time, I come and kneel at these altars and talk to the Lord. There are uh, some places at a hospital in Louisiana that I could take you to where when I had a loved one who was um, very very sick and unfortunately did not survive there were some specific places that I was able to find to go to where I could be alone with God and pour my heart out to God uh, maybe there are some places in your home I hope you have a place of prayer in your home but maybe there's a place at a camp meeting at a campground somewhere and while we don't worship those locations, we can go to those places from time to time to reflect and to remember and to uh, pray again and to be very confident in our walk with God and just have another conversation with Him. Now, I know you can talk with God anywhere and you should talk with God wherever you are, but sometimes there are these places that stick out for us. And if you have some of those, there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, there's everything good with that. Another place that he went to was Jericho. Jericho was a place of battle. It was here that God gave his people a major victory over the enemy. Maybe this is where Elijah went to reflect on that day at Mount Carmel where fire came down from heaven and uh, consumed the sacrifice. And eventually uh, the prophets of Baal were defeated. Perhaps he reflected on that day at Mount Horeb where that still small voice gave him victory over his discouragement. Um, do you have any places where there have been some battles? 
Uh, I know there have been some times, some locations where I've had some battles, if you will. And I've seen victory through the grace of God. Those places are significant to me. And from time to time, even if I can't go to those places physically, I reflect on the battles that the Lord has brought me through. The, the battles that the Lord has brought uh, me through with his help and the ones that he's fought on my behalf that I'm aware of. I'm sure there are a whole lot more that he's fought on my behalf that I'm not aware of. Is there a Jericho in your life? Is there a place where you were facing a situation that seemed insurmountable, where walls were built up and you had no idea if or how they could ever come down? And yet God provided and those walls did come down. It was your own Jericho. Wherever those places are, even if you can't physically go there, I hope you can go there in reflection within your mind's eye. And remember that God brought you through those difficult times and he will take you through more difficult times that may come up in the future. Elijah went to Gilgal, a place of beginnings. Bethel, a place of prayer. Jericho, a place of battle. But also he went to the Jordan River. And that is a place of death. There have been a lot of gospel songs penned using crossing the Jordan as an analogy of passing from this world to the next. I want to suggest to you tonight that that analogy can be good, but maybe there's another analogy that we need to consider. Maybe the Jordan River, just maybe the Jordan River, is an analogy of us dying to ourselves and being made alive in Christ. If that's the case, I just want you to know there, there have been a lot of Jordan Rivers in my life. Not necessarily physical locations, but just times in my life where I realized I needed to die to some pride, to some arrogance, to some self-desire, to my own will, where I had to die to self so that Christ could be formed in me to the degree that he wanted to be formed in me. I don't know where there's places may be for you. I don't know um, what points in your life that you've had to, to get to, to uh, maybe experience that, but I can tell you this. If you are honestly following Christ and you're seeking him on a regular basis, he's going to show you those places where you need to continually die to self and you need to cross that spiritual Jordan, if you will, and go on to the other side of the new life that Christ has for us. Now, if the Jordan River is an analogy for physical death, um, none of us know where that's really going to be for us as individuals. But we do know where some of those places were for our loved ones. Uh, that's one reason that we go to cemeteries and pay our respects. While our loved ones didn't die at the cemetery, that's where their bodies or their ashes have been laid to rest. And we go to those places to reminisce, to, to, to be uh, reminded, to honor, maybe even to talk to them. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with going to the gravesite and talking to your loved one. No, I don't believe they're there. I believe they're on to their eternal reward. But sometimes it's good and healthy for us to just go and see that physical representation of a place uh, that reminds us of their lives and just speak our hearts and minds openly. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, I'm keenly aware they're not there and we can't really talk to them. But sometimes it does us good just to say at times like that what's on our heart and mind. I don't know where your Gilgal, your Bethel, your uh, Jericho, or your Jordan may be, but I do know this. You don't have to be living your last day to reflect on these times. As a matter of fact, we ought to not wait until our last day to reflect on these times. We ought to reflect on them now. We ought to reflect on them uh, as the Lord brings them to our heart and mind. And as we do so, we ought to do so in such a way, God helping us, that we become better people for Him. Now, as we consider uh, Elijah's departure, just a few other things that I want us to note. Elijah tried repeatedly 
to distance himself from Elisha. He kept telling Elisha, hey, the Lord's calling me to go on over here to Bethel. Why don't you just stay here in Gilgal? And uh, Elisha said, nope, I'm going with you. Then after they got to, to Gilgal, he said, hey, the Lord's calling me on over to Bethel. Uh, why don't you just stay here? And Elisha said, no way, I'm not leaving you. I'm going with you. In the same way with going on to the Jordan, even uh, or to Jericho rather, and then he even crossed the, from there to the Jordan River and crossed the Jordan River with him. Um, there's something key for us to take note of. Uh, we all need somebody close to us, all right? A lot of times, and guys are maybe more guilty of this than ladies, but we think we're big and tough and we can handle everything by ourselves. Well, I know we're supposed to handle some things on our own, but there are a whole lot of other things that God has said, you know what, I want to give you some, somebody in the flesh, somebody in person to help you. Uh, now, we have God through His Spirit, uh, the paraclete of God, the comforter who dwells within us, and that is good and right. We can always rely on Him. But sometimes God gives us people, and thank God for that. Um, Elijah had Elisha. Uh, you know, Paul had Silas and very other various other traveling companions. Uh, we all need some godly friends to be around us. And in this particular case, Elijah had Elisha, who I guess we could say was his friend. He was definitely his understudy, if you will. And uh, Elijah was to Elisha his mentor. So we're going to see how that plays out a little bit in the rest of this story. But just it will suffice to say this, wherever you are in life, please don't close yourself off to everybody. Uh, you may have been hurt by some people. I understand that. But there are some God-fearing people whom you can trust who can be a good friend to you. You've got to seek the Lord and how to go about that. But let God love you through his people. Okay? Elijah had Elisha. Another thing that we see in this is that Elisha made a pretty big request of Elijah. He said these words after Elijah asked him, hey, what do you want me to do for you? And his response was, I want you to give me a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah even looked back at him and said, boy, you're asking for a whole lot there, aren't you? And he was. Um, and he ended up getting that, by the way. He got what he, had, he asked for. And we can know that because if you go through and you count the number of miracles that Elijah did, you can uh, go and study Elisha's life and you will find out that he performed twice as many miracles, at least recorded in scripture. There are twice as many recorded miracles of Elisha as there was Elijah. That's not to take away from Elijah in any way. It is simply to highlight that Elisha asked for something really, really big from his master. That begs this question. Uh, do you think you and I sometimes don't ask God for enough? Do we ever limit him? I mean, maybe God wants to give us more than we can ever think or imagine. If you read in Ephesians, we know that God is able to do more than we can ever think or imagine. He also tells us throughout Scripture, you know, we have not because we ask not. Now, now, I understand that maybe we could ask for things we really don't need, but here's the thing. Maybe God just wants to bless us abundantly, and He's waiting on us to ask Him. And quite honestly, if we ask and we really don't need it, and it's not going to be something that God's going to be honored with, He'll probably tell us no anyway. Now, I know none of us like being told no, but here's my point. Why don't we ask big things from God and see what he's going to do? Whatever great thing God's placed within your heart, ask him for it. Elisha was not afraid to ask big. May God give us the faith to seek him and to ask big from him as well. The last thing that I want us to see, and we'll close. At Elijah's departure, there was somebody else to take his place. Elijah goes up in that chariot of fire. 
God takes him and honors him in, in, a, in an amazing departure from this world. But Elijah had done a whole lot of great things for, the, for God. Who was going to take over? Well, Elisha was. Now, you read through the account as we did a few moments ago, and you find out that Elijah's mantle fell, and Elisha picked it up, and Elisha then took that mantle over to the Jordan River, and, and uh, he was able to part the, the Jordan River and walk over on dry ground. And the guys there, if you keep on reading, the other prophets there said, hey, the spirit of Elijah now rests on Elisha. God had another person to take on the work at Elijah's departure. There's always someone else that God has. When he takes someone out, he has someone else to fill that spot. Um, Chuck Swindoll put it so very, very well in his book about Elijah called Elijah, a man of heroism and humility. I want to read his words for us. When a man or woman of God dies, nothing of God dies. We tend to forget this. We get so caught up in the lives of certain individuals that we begin to think we cannot do without them. What limited thinking. When even a might a mighty servant is gone. God has 7,000 who have never bowed a knee to Baal. He has them ready, waiting in the wings. Classic case in point is Elisha. God always has a backup plan. I'm glad to know that that is true. I hope, my friends, uh, that there are important people in your lives that uh, have taught you the Word of God, encouraged you in the Word of God, model, most importantly, modeled the Word of God for you. And it is good and right to look up to them and to learn from them. But I want you to know, when God calls them home, our faith should not be crumbled by their departure. Our faith ought to be enhanced by their departure. And we ought to understand that now it is our responsibility to carry on God's work as he gifts and enables us to do so. Uh, when Elijah departed, God had Elisha to take his place. And when it's our time to go from this world, there will be somebody else who takes our place and does what God has uh, to be done in that generation and in that time. So tonight, as we have studied Elijah's departure from this world, I want us to end with, I guess, uh, a rather sobering question. Are we ready for our own departure? Have we made peace with God? Are we doing what we're supposed to do to carry on his work, the work that he wants to do through us for his glory? Are, are we taking some time maybe to reflect and to remember and to go to those certain places, if you will, at least in our mind or in our spirit, to Remember those times of calling, and those, those times of prayer, and those times of battle, and even those times of death, dying to self. Um, we need to be ready for when our, time, when our time in this world is over, because we're not going to spend eternity in this world. And if we happen to be among those who are alive when Christ returns, we're still going to be departing from this world. As we have studied Elijah's departure tonight, may we be encouraged and challenged to be prepared for our own. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate your time and attention. God bless you, and have a good evening.